2 Kings. We're going to do a Bible study on the issue of high places. 2 Kings chapter 15. Still working to prepare the launching of our Daniel series. I do apologize that it's taken me longer than the month or so I expected. I've explained it already, but for those who don't know, so you can pray. Uh, the Know Your Bible Insights series uh, became a lot more intense than I expected it would when I first outlined that course. So I've had to kind of revisit the outline a couple of times. Actually, I didn't kind of revisit it. I just sort of revisited it. And I didn't sort of revisit it. I revisited it. <laughs> but anyway, so I've gone back to the outline and looked at it more carefully and broke it down. And that was effort number one. Well, I've gone to it again and broke it down further. It's slowing us down in terms of getting through all these stories, but it's going to allow me to be alive long enough to preach them. <laughs> I mean, you know, 40 hours in one message was getting a little, it was getting just a little out of hand. So I think I've got that whittled down now. This message took me about 10, so that's, uh, that's okay. You know, the average length of time I invest in a single message in preparation usually is between five and six, but you understand that's on top of thousands of hours of study. You get how that works, right? You know, it's not like the message is a preacher out of five hours of study. No, it's coming out of a whole lifetime of study. But five hours of preparation is usually the average. So, but these messages have been very intensive in terms of preparation, partly because of all the different steps I have added to what I'm doing. You know, publishing the notes for you to have in advance, creating my crib notes that I preach from, creating the cue sheet that is used for the overhead. I mean, it's, there's... <laughs> A lot of steps involved in all this in any event. <laughs> I'm really gratified with that series. Your response has been, off, uh, has been outstanding. The, uh, uh, the messages have been very satisfying to me in my preparation and delivery. I'm just looking forward to seeing that get kind of uh, in a stride, in a pace that I can handle, you know. And I think we've done it, uh, as I think you'll see in this coming message. So I have a couple more Sundays before I'm going to launch the Daniel series. Uh, this Sunday, of course, we're going to teach a lesson on high places. Uh, next Sunday, I believe we have a guest here. I think it's the famous Bible teacher. Um, uh, what's his name again? He's real famous. Everybody knows him. Um, Lloyd Campbell. <laughs> he didn't know that till just now. So <laughs> but anyway, he'll teach the Sunday school. Pastor Sanchez will preach the... Uh, morning service and we have a missionary guest who will be here uh, Sunday night so it's coming Sunday I'll be preaching somewhere where am I did I get confused on where I'm, I'm I think I'm with Greg Kern it might be the week after there's a week coming in which Brother Lloyd's going to preach uh, it's in two weeks from now okay so uh, so, okay, so you, everybody knows Lloyd. I want to have him do the Sunday school. You take care of the preaching service Sunday morning. And then we have a missionary that night. I forget who the missionary is. Who is it? Thong Di. This, oh, the 26th. That's the, that's the Sunday I'm talking about. And Brother Benefil will be here to preach Sunday night. That's right. Amen. Well, your enthusiastic response is very encouraging. Okay, probably because probably you want to get into some Bible here. That's good. All right. First, uh, Second Kings, I'm sorry, chapter 15. Let's look at verses uh, 32 through the end of the chapter. The Bible says in Second Kings chapter number 15, verse 32, in the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, Ramaliah. Uh, most of these names have the accent on the last syllable, by the way, in the Hebrew language, but not always. King of Israel began... Jotham, or Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And my wife, if we had a daughter, wanted to name her Jerusha. Jerusha. So anyway, um, that didn't happen, obviously. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still 
in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham or Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send against Judah, Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. Well, the, the service of Jotham to his people was good. He was a good king. Did well. He was esteemed highly by the Holy Ghost in the evaluation of his service. Have you ever had a job where you have an evaluation at the end of certain periods? I've had that, of course. And of course, as, a, as an employer, I've done that often, especially when I was principal. We have these evaluations. I go sit in the classroom and listen to the teacher teach as part of the evaluation and then have interviews and look over the records and all of this stuff and then write up a kind of, uh, well, evaluation. And that would be used in terms of you know, increases in pay or whether or not we renewed the contract. All that kind of stuff was involved in that, right? Well, you, throughout the book of the Kings, you have these evaluations where the Holy Spirit offers an evaluation of the king. And this king got a good evaluation. But there was one negative, and sometimes that would happen. I'd have a very good teacher, and there'd be one thing that we need to work on. There's always a little NI on the report somewhere, right? Needs improvement. Um, of course, we would turn the tables and let them evaluate to me as well. And it was consistent that the teachers that got the worst evaluation gave me the worst one. So anyway. <laughs> but, but it's helpful. It's helpful to kind of get a look-see through other eyes of what's going on. Wouldn't it be nice if the Lord would give you an evaluation from time to time? If he'd just come visit you and say, okay, here's how it's going. Maybe that wouldn't be so good. <laughs> well, he just sat down with you, uh, say once a month, once every, once a year would be, probably as much as we could endure, and, uh, and sit down and just say, okay, here's how things are going. This looks good. This looks good. Need some help here. This needs to be corrected. Whatever. Evaluation. We can if we judge ourselves, we need not be judged. And so it's a good idea to do some self-evaluation. Let every man examine himself. It's good to do your own evaluation. And you use the word of God to do it. And so these kings, so many of them, who did good in their evaluation, they had one thing they missed. They missed the high places. What are these high places? They're mentioned 98 times in the Bible. 97 of the 98 times that they are mentioned, you find them in the Old Testament. 97 of the 98 times. There's one New Testament reference to the high places. Let's open our Bibles and look at it. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. And this reference in the New Testament to the high places actually gives us some important insight into what these high places are all about. <clears throat> Ephesians 6 and verse number 12. The Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, someone might argue that, well, now these high places aren't the same thing as those high places spoken of in the Old Testament. Well, I beg to differ. I think there is spiritual insight given to us that helps us understand why God was so displeased with the high places that are mentioned 97 times in the Old Testament. It's because spiritual wickedness takes place in these high places. Spiritual wickedness takes place in the high places. Hmm. So what are they? What is a high place? Well, in the Old Testament, it referred to a place that was set aside to present offerings to your gods. It was a practice among the heathen to have these little places. You see this in India. You'll see it in a lot of, a lot of the uh, countries where paganism is the strongest you know, s spiritual element in the culture. You'll see these little shrines. You'll see it in Mexico. It's weird little shrines to Mary or to whatever, a saint or something like this. And uh, they, they often, sometimes they'll have food set in front of the little image there and all that kind of stuff. And 
it's a little it's strange to us because we didn't grow up around that. But when you travel to these other places, you'll see a lot of that. Well, that's, that was a high place. It was a place somewhere along the road or somewhere in a grove often or somewhere often on a, on a high hill. That's one reason they're called high places is because they were often set on these little hills. Although it's a mistake to think that's the meaning of the expression. The idea of high place here isn't about elevation. It's about esteem, reverence. It's a high place in the sense that it's considered high, reverent, uh, with esteem, with respect, uh, that kind of thing. So a high place could be in a low place. <laughs> you know, but it would still be a high place because it was considered to be a place where men met God. It's a place where you could give God a sacrifice and hopefully re in return a favor from him. That was the idea of a high place. So the Bible teaches us that these offerings that the pagans were presenting to their idols and so on in their high places were offerings made to devils. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that's made very clear to us. The Bible teaches that they, what they offered to their idols, they offered actually to devils. And so that's the spiritual wickedness that's going on in these high places. You see, God ordained for the Old Testament Jew, the Israelite, God ordained that they would bring their offerings to, to Jerusalem. That was what God said was supposed to be done. That was God's way. But the Israelites were fond, for many reasons, partly perhaps because of convenience. It's a lot more convenient to just have to walk down the street <laughs> instead of having to take a trip all the way to Jerusalem uh, and so on. So they would use these high places. They tended to follow the pattern of the world around them in the way they worshipped. And you've heard me speak to this before. It's one of the problems with Newcart churches. They are patterning their worship after the manners and customs and so on of the world rather than coming from the word in, in the development of their worship. They're coming out of the world from that point of view and it creates a problem. Well, that's, this is kind of going into the same, same thing. This high place worship was something that the heathen did. But God ordained that they should bring their offerings to the house of God in Zion. You can see that in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, and really all over the place in the Old Testament after Moses. So the Israelites, however, would fall into the practice of using these high places like their heathen neighbors did. Now in their mind, they were worshiping Jehovah God in their high place. In their mind. They assumed, or they believed, that what they were doing was okay because, well, they're not giving their uh, offering to Moloch or they're not giving their offering to Chemosh, although they did finally go there. And that's the problem with this high place business because they would start using the high places thinking, well, there's a nice idea. There's a neat idea. I can just build my own. You know, they have their little shrine to their God. I'll have a shrine to my God. And so they would do that. And then they would start worshiping and bringing their offerings there and this kind of thing. And, but over time, it corrupted them because they didn't realize they were engaging in spiritual wickedness. What is wickedness? Wickedness is rebellion against God's righteousness. That's what it is. Wickedness is twisting and turning the right ways of God and distorting them into the wrong ways of Satan. That's what wickedness literally is. And so this is spiritual wickedness. The right way of God to worship was being distorted and twisted into worshiping God in the wrong way, in the way the heathen worshiped their God. God did not want his people worshiping him the way the heathen worshiped their gods. He gave them very clear instruction that they were to come to Jerusalem for to worship. They were to bring their offerings to Jerusalem and to the temple and to the house of God. So there's a principle that 
when we sacrifice to idols, we are sacrificing to the devils behind them, right? I mentioned that verse earlier. It's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So sacrificing or using the high places in worship actually involved engaging devils. Now, my guess is that the Israelite, the typical Israelite, didn't go to the high place saying, can't wait to meet my devil today. Right? They didn't know. They didn't understand what they were getting involved with. They didn't realize that worshiping God in this other way actually put them in a position where they were engaging devils. Yikes! And that's, what's, that's what Ephesians 6 verse 12 makes clear. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. We fight the same battle today. We have our own version of the high places. Let's discuss that a little bit, get you started thinking about it. We won't be able to identify every high place in everybody's life. I think some of them are perhaps hidden in your heart. You have a little high place in your heart. And we'll kind of touch on that a little bit. You might have high places in your home, high places in your life. We are commanded to gather in the assembly of the believers. And I'm preaching to the choir today, right, because you're all here. But we are commanded to gather in the assembly of the believers. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now that word assembling is a word that literally defines what churching means, what going to church means. Church, the word church comes from a, a Saxon word, kirke, which means, or kirke, which means house of God or the Lord, something that belongs to the Lord, the Lord's house. And that comes, it's a long, interesting story how we come to the word church, but, um, and I'm hesitant to get into it, but anyway, I will just for a moment. But we know that the word church, um, I'm sorry, the word church, that's the word that translated church in the Bible is ecclesia, right? Or ecclesia. And that means ek, called, or out, ecclesia, uh, called. So out called people or called out ones, right? You've heard that, I'm sure. Ecclesia or the word church means called out ones. Well, that's not really true. If you take the word ecclesia and you break it down, it's true. Uh, you have ek, which in the Greek would be out ecclesia, which is the idea of being assembled or called. And so, yeah, if you do that. But the same thing then would be true of the word automobile. Um, because then you'd have to say the word automobile means self-moving. But I'm not an automobile. I'm self-moving, but I'm not an automobile. The word automobile was created by these two words, auto and mobile, to create a term that identified a thing that we drive around in that we call a car. So the word automobile does not mean self-moving. The word automobile means car. Well, the word ecclesia is the same way. The Greeks coined a word to identify a regularly convening group of persons appointed by the state or the city to conduct its business for a period of time. And they would disband and reconvene and disband and reconvene. And it was called an ecclesia. And Jesus used that word to identify his church. He calls his church an ecclesia. He did it on purpose. He used that word that meant a regularly convening body of persons who are charged with the task of carrying on the business of, in that case, the state. Jesus used the word to identify a regularly convening group of, we believe, baptized believers whose purpose is to carry on his business, his kingdom business, through out until he comes again so that's what a church is and the bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is see some even in that day were already dropping out of church they were no longer gathering with the assembly and so the apostle paul by the holy ghost speaks this injunction that that you're not supposed to do that in fact he said you should be more fastidious in your church membership and your church activity as we get closer to the end. So much the more as you see the day approaching. So we should, you know, be in church. 
I told uh, somebody recently, I said, uh, among, all the, uh, among a long list of reasons I go to church, included in that list are things like I love to see the people there, and I love, I love God's people, and I like, I like God's word, and I like God's music. And I, I mean, there's just a long list of reasons I go to church, but there's in that list this too. I'm there because Jesus told me to be there. King Jesus, my Lord, who died for me on the cross of Calvary, told me, be in church. King Jesus, the one who died for me on the cross of Calvary, He's the one that started the church. He's the one that made it. It's his thing. And that would be foolish and arrogant on my part to assume. Uh, who needs that? No, so for one very strong reason that I'm in church is because King Jesus told me to be here and I'm a faithful soldier. I obey the command of the Lord. You understand what I'm, you get where I'm coming from here. So I don't need to feel like going to church. I just need to be there. Amen? I don't even need to look forward to it, although I do. I don't need to look forward to it. I just need to be there. I need to be there who I need to be there no matter who's preaching. I need to be there. I need to support my church. Why? Because it's Jesus' thing. So we need to be in church. And we're commanded to be in church, and it's a good place to be. The joke I hear all so often when I'm traveling, how many of you would rather be here than the best jail in Santa Maria? course everybody's like oh good and you're glad to be here <clears throat> but uh we thank god that we don't have to worry about going to going to jail if we go to church let's take advantage of our freedom and let's be in church okay and again i'm talking to people who, who come to church here you are but maybe you could take this and go tell the people who aren't here that the preacher said you're supposed to be in church more importantly jesus said you're supposed to be in church that's more important all right but anyway so we need to be in church because Jesus commanded it. Now here's how you can get into a high place problem. <clears throat> Jesus ordained the church to be the assembly place for God's people. Where they are trained to do and to keep all his commandments. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. He organized the church for that purpose. And so he appointed gifts. You know, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastor, teachers. And he puts these people in place to do something called feeding the flock of God, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. All this is in the Bible. So God is the one that organized all this. He made this thing called church. He organized who the officers would be. The Bible says the Holy Spirit appoints the overseer to a flock with the job to feed the flock of God. That's all from God. Amen. And so my attitude, by, by the way, about being a church uh, goes long before I became a pastor. All right? I mean, just because people sometimes think, oh, he goes to church because he's the pastor. No, I go to church because, because Jesus told me to. I go to church for all the same reasons you go. And so on. And so, uh, but God is the one who organized all this stuff, you know. And the Holy Ghost appoints these overseers whose job is to feed the flock of God. So there, my point here is there's something going on here that transcends the physical stuff. <clears throat> there's something bigger happening here, even right now, <clears throat> excuse me, than me standing here talking to you. There's something bigger going on in this room right now than you sitting there listening to somebody talk to you. There's something larger happening here. The Holy Ghost is doing what he does in the assembly as Jesus ordained it. So, you know, if, if people who are physically orientated, they only see the physical, then to them going to church is more about seeing one another. And that is part of it, by the way. <clears throat> it's more about all kinds of different things. But those who have eyes to see and ears to understand, who have an understanding heart, who know what the Scripture says about these things and who get it, they'll come into the assembly expecting to meet with God in a very real way in a way that's, that's unique in the house of God, that's unique from other opportunities we have to be with God. God moves in his assembly. And that's a different, I, I could spend an entire lesson on only that point. I don't want to go further into that right now because I want to go here next. People find substitutes for church. In the same way that the Israelites found substitutes for going to Jerusalem to worship, Christians today find substitutions for church. 
I'm glad we have this Facebook thing and the internet and all that. I think it's a great opportunity to expand ministry and to reach more lives. I think it's a very good thing. But anybody who decides, well, you know, hey, Lighthouse has their stuff live stream now. I can just stay at church and stay at home. No, that's your, your, watch out. You're starting to build a high place. You understand what I'm saying? You're creating a substitute for doing what God told you to do. You need to be with God's people. Looking at one another, with one another, talking one another, feeding one another. Because not only is the shepherd, who is also a sheep, by the way. Somebody got me a doll. It's a sheep. It's dressed up like a shepherd. I love it. I keep it on my desk all the time. It, not that I ever forget. But I'm a sheep too. See? Exactly like you. Under the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. But he appointed me to be to shepherd his flock under his authority. So <clears throat> when, we're, when we're in fellowship together in the church, we feed each other. I mean, your encouragement, you know, you know uh, uh, Mitch and uh, Mary Ellen have a little ministry out here with the, that's, that's part of ministering to the flock. The ushers, you know, barking at you about where to sit. No, <laughs> Um, but that's not, they're very kind and very, very gracious. We have some of the best ushers in all of California. <laughs> but uh, we do. And, uh, you know, the music ministers and the, and the musicians and the Sunday school teachers in the back and the junior church preacher and the nursery workers, all these people are ministering. Human to human. Right? Person to person. It's personal. Sitting in front of a monitor and watching it on, on the screen is fine. If you're sick and you can't, we've had several times where somebody has written me and said, I'm so grateful that we've got, you know, it's on live stream now because I can't come to church. I'm sick, but I get to at least, you know, kind of participate that way. So amen. But it's never a substitute for being there, is it? It isn't a substitute for being there. So we want to be careful that we don't allow that to happen. Some people use uh, TV ministers as going to church. They don't even go to church at all. They just find their favorite preacher on TV and they watch him on TV. That's a high place. That's a high place. It's a substitution for doing what God commanded us to do. God's people need to be in a real live body of believers connected with them and accountable to them. There's accountability issues too. You know, the Bible says, um, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Accountability is a huge part of walking in the Spirit, according to Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. That last item there, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So there's accountability that's important. Um, and I don't mean the sheep need to go around, you know, policing each other. I mean, let's be careful. Our spirit is not, you know, like that. But we provoke one another uh, to good works with love, right? How does that verse go? We provoke one, provoking one another in, to love and good works. I think it's yeah. I think it's to love and good works. Isn't that same chapter that tells us to be in church? We are to provoke one another to love and good works. So it's great, you know. You come to the church and you see people, uh, fellow believers in the Lord, and they encourage you. And they see you a little down. They might come over and talk to you a little bit, and encourage you, lift you up. You get what I'm saying? It's a family. It's a family of God and we need each other and we, we are interconnected and we need to get together regularly. See, uh, at the dinner table. See, is what we're doing here now. We're at the dinner table together and we're eating and, and enjoying fellowship that way and stuff like this. But anyway, so without carrying that any further, you get my point. Jesus ordained that the house of God, the church, would be supported in the same way that the Old Testament priesthood was supported. And that's through tithes and offerings. You can open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and you'll see what I'm saying here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, look at verse 14. Everybody knows that Moses, by the Holy Spirit, instructed the congregation of the Lord to support the priesthood, the tabernacle, the temple, all of that, by tithes and offerings. Now, these tithes, of course, that's a, a habit among God's people that goes all the way back to Abraham. 
when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is the king of Jerusalem. And then Jacob took upon himself the vow of tithing. Remember, we talked about that a few messages back. He promised, of everything that you give me, I will give you the tenth. So Jacob stepped into the steps of his grandfather Abraham, and he picked up that personal responsibility to tithe. And then it was incorporated into the law about 400 years later uh, by Moses. And then it was made a law. All right. And so the people were obliged to tithe, and the tithe was used to support the priesthood. Now, we're in the New Testament. The Old Testament's fulfilled. That old covenant, that, that old contract's all done. Signed, sealed, it's over. It's like the la last payment on your mortgage. You paid it, it's done. You go burn the mortgage, right? You have a mortgage burning ceremony. There's an Old Testament burning ceremony, but when I say Old Testament, don't think I mean Genesis through, uh, through Malachi. I mean the, the covenant that God made with Moses, or through Moses with Israel. That covenant, that contract was completed. It was satisfied. So we don't give in the same way as they did under the law, but we follow the example. That's what Jesus is saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I'll read the verses that come into that. <clears throat> He's talking about how the Old Testament priesthood was supported. So when he comes to verse 14, it says, even so, he's referring back to that. And that expression, even so, means after the same pattern, or in the same manner, or in the same way. So in the same way that God ordained, the tithe would be used to support the Old Testament priesthood, Jesus Christ has ordained that the tithe would be used to support the New Testament ministry. Same thing. So that's what that even so comes. It's very strong. And here's where I'm going with this. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus Christ ordained. And if you ordain something, that means that you have said, this is the way it's going to be. <laughs> All right. Here's what I want. This is my will. This is my way. This is what I intend for you to do. He ordained it. So Jesus ordained this for us. Uh, it's not a law in the same sense that they operate under the Old Testament law. We don't send you a bill. Nobody who comes to our church signs a, a contract to tithe like you do in the Mormon church where you have to stipulate the, your income and then sign a promise to tithe. We don't do that kind of stuff. Right? Why? Because it's free will. It's something you do between you and God. But you need to know, as your, as your under-shepherd, I need to tell you that's what Jesus wants you to do. Whether or not you do it, it's between you and him. Not, not between you and me. Make sense? I don't police it. Right? But I, I know one pastor that did. He would, <laughs> this guy was something else. He was a Baptist pastor. I think guy's crazy. He would have the treasurer give him a report on everybody who gave. And he'd go through it. If he saw somebody didn't give, he'd call them. So what's wrong? Where's your tithe? Now, to his credit, though, I would never do that. No, that's not to his credit. <laughs> Let me, I, I built that sentence wrong. Let's begin with, I would never do that. <laughs> but now, to his credit, when he explained it to us, he said, you, you think that's just because I'm worried about the bottom line of the church budget. I'm not. I'm worried about their lives. He said, I've noticed over years and years of ministry, the first thing to stop is the tithe. That when they stop tithing, they're spiritually turning. And so I just catch it early. So, uh, now, I wouldn't go there for reasons I don't care to get into. One, it's just way too nosy. And I mean, I don't have a personality that puts up with that in my own life. I'm not going to stick my nose in, in your life that way. I just, I just can't do that. Maybe I should. I don't know. But don't worry, I'm not going to. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> I don't believe that's the way I should handle this problem. But I do believe I need to teach you. The Bible says this is what Jesus expects. This is what Jesus ordained. Okay. Now, if I take the tithe, if I, if I, get, if I get to thinking like this, well, I think I'll, I think I'll use the tithe to uh, support, you know, Joel Osteen. I picked him because nobody here is going to do that, but just as an example. I really like that guy. He gets me motivated. Well, I listen to Joel Osteen. I feel like I can take on the world. 
It might make me a little bit more like the world than I want to be, but I can sure take it on. In any event, somebody like that, you know, some other ministry that's glamorous and exciting and amazing. And so we take the tithe, say, well, I'm going to give it over there. Well, there are a lot of problems with that. But the first problem with it is, that's not what Jesus said. The Bible teaches that the church is the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is. We already talked about what the church is. It's organized in churches today. Local assemblies of regularly convening baptized believers who work together for the purpose of carrying out Christ's mission in earth, anticipating his soon return. So each local church is the church. All right? So I'm a member of that church. If I join that church, and that's biblical, by the way. The Bible talks about uh, that uh, ye are the body of Christ. Paul talking to the Corinthian church, ye are the body of Christ. It's not some universal body. Each local church is the body of Christ. See? And so if I'm a member of that body, and he says, and you are members one of another. So we have a connection with each other as a member of this body. Right? So my responsibilities with regard to this kind of thing is to this church assembly. In the same way that in the Old Testament, the believers were all responsible for the house of God in Jerusalem. It's different for us in a lot of ways. And one of them is this. We are responsible for our local church. So my tithe comes to this storehouse. Right? My tithe doesn't go to somebody else's this storehouse. Now, I can give an offering over there if I want to. Right? I can give offerings. I can give an offering to anybody I want to. If I feel, I, well, I mean, I have that liberty to do that, but I should listen to the Holy Spirit and follow Him <clears throat> and be careful about that because you don't want to be investing in a ministry that's not, you know, that's not really worthy. So you want to be careful about that. But there's nothing at all wrong with me sending money to A.J. Harold over there in Los Angeles. All right? Uh, or sending money to whatever, Tim Bedefeld or somebody else. These different preachers that are doing work and so on in different places. I can send them offerings, send offerings to mis foreign missionaries, all that kind of stuff. But the tithe belongs to the house. All right? That's for the house. That's what that's for. I believe with all my heart that if every believer within a church family did this, that church would have everything that it needed because I believe God ordained the tithe to meet the needs. And so I believe and that's the way he meets them. And I believe that's what would happen. And I thank God for a church that tithes. So, you know, it's why even though we're a smaller church that a lot of churches, our ministry is very, very large. And one of the reasons is because we have faithful people who give. Amen. Uh, I, I tell you right now, I know for a fact that some of these churches that, that have, you know, 500, 600, 700 people, even in our town, they're suffering financially. Yeah. They're barely able to keep the ends together. Why? Because they're full of a bunch of people that don't tithe. <laughs> they got a lot of people there, but the people don't tithe. They don't do it God's way. The biblical way, the biblical way of financing a church ministry is through the tithes of God's people. That's just the way God ordained it, and so that's just the way that it is. Um, you know, I think, anyway, I want to I want to get farther over into that either, but the point is, if I take the tithe that is ordained by Jesus to be used for the support of the ministry that I'm connected to, and I use that somewhere else or do something else with it, I'm into high places. It's a spiritual activity when I'm watching um, some TV show of a preacher over. By the way, there's nothing wrong with watching TV shows of preaching. I encourage it. It's probably a whole lot better than most of what you watch. Unless you want listening to some heretic. But if you've got, you know, a good, decent Bible preaching going on and you got, man, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not a substitute for church. Okay, that's the point. That's when it becomes high place. Now, same thing with my giving. If I decide, well, I believe in tithing, but I'm going to give the tithe, you know, here and there as I feel led of the Lord. 
Well, if you want to give it according to the leading of the Lord, read the Bible, read it carefully, pay attention to what it's saying, and you'll find out that where he wants the tithe to go is to the house of God. That's where he wants it. And so if I'm taking that and using it somewhere else, well, then I'm, I'm doing a spiritual thing, but I'm doing it my way. And that's exactly what the high place thing was all about. It was doing spiritual stuff, but not the way God said to do it. The way they decided to do it themselves. And so that's high place worship. And the danger is, without realizing it, you're engaging and interacting with devils. The devil is taking advantage of the lives of people who do that to hurt the thing that Jesus made called the church. That's what he's doing. He's slapping at that church. He hates that thing called church because Jesus loves it. He hates that thing called church because if we do it God's way, then God's blessing is in it. And if God's blessing is in it and his presence is in it, then Satan loses place. Satan gains place in our lives and around us when we go high places. Because now we're engaging with devils and we're doing things the wrong way and it doesn't, and it pushes, it grieves him out and invites the devil in. And so, you know, we have a lot of problems among the Christians today because of high place worship. Because so many Christians have forsaken the way of the Lord and decided, well, I'm going to serve God, but I'm going to serve him this way instead of the way the Bible says. And so it creates a lot of problems. So uh, we are to worship the Lord, our God, and him only. And we'll conclude with this. Now, to worship means to surrender our will to the control of whatever it is we worship. You, you follow what I'm saying? People think they're worshiping God when they're emotional and they're moving, and they could be. They could be. That could be worship. I don't misunderstand me. But some people think that because they're very emotional and they're very stirred up and they feel very full of emotional reaction and response, they feel like they're worshiping. But they're not worshiping unless their will is surrendered to God. <laughs> very important to understand that. Worship doesn't begin until not my will but thine. That's when real worship starts. That's the juncture between spiritual high place type worship and genuine, authentic, Holy Ghost worship. I mean, worship that is generated by the Holy Spirit acting in you, God acting in you, God revealing in you His mind, His word, through His word, the word of God, and you seeing it by the enlightening of the Holy Spirit, and you're responding to that, and your will is surrendering to it. Now you're worshiping. And it might take various expressions. It might take this expression. Right? But other things can give you this going on. I've been to many concerts. Remember, when I was a, uh, a kid, I used to go to hear people like Jimi Hendrix. How I many of you know who that is? Right? Yeah, well, it's amazing. Even some of the younger hands went up. That's, uh, that's kind of unsettling. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway... But uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, I used to go to his concerts and, thing, and things like this. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Those people get into it. They get into it. They're doing this and they're doing it, you know, wiggling all over the place. They're running. Right? My son went, went across the, these, this church called the Element, which is the weirdest name for a church. I can't even imagine. And the symbol for the church looks like the four elements. I don't know what's going on. I, gotta, I want to find one of these people and talk to them. I said, what are you doing? It looks pagan to me. But anyway. So they've landed right there in front of my house practically. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad. Because they are rocking out, man. They were rocking out this morning. I'm serious. We, fortunately, our house is insulated enough, and so I'm pretty well protected if, if I'm in the house. But if I walk outside on Sunday morning, it's, bow, 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 and they got it going on. So, you know, New Cart Church. Well, they had a block party recently in my neighborhood. A block party. 
I was a little concerned about that because when I was a kid, we had a block party. You'd close off the block. Happily, they didn't do that, so that was good news. But they sent out these invitations, and my son decided to go get a free tri-tip meal. Yeah, traitor. <laughs> and another guy went with him named Joaquin. And I didn't know that Zachary had hired a gardener, but he, Joaquin the gardener went with Zachary to the, uh, to the block party. And so they're getting their meal, and they go inside, and the pastor announces mosh pit. How many of you know what a mosh pit is? You remember that a while back? He corrected himself, or tried to, but it was a mosh pit. And everybody was wiggling around and bouncing into each other, and the guys encouraged him. Dance like you're saved. How, how do you... How does that look? <laughs> Sing like you're saved. Da, 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 da. Whatever. The point I'm making is it's obviously uh, intersecting with the world where they're becoming like the world instead of the world becoming more like the word and it's, it's high place worship. And they're really into it and they're very emotional but there's very little surrender to the will of God in it. I mean, that I can see anyway. It doesn't, you know, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. That's a command from God. And that doesn't look like a coming out from among them to be separate. That looks like a going in among them to look just like them. It doesn't look like a separation type thing. It looks like an integration type thing. And so there's no surrender to the will of God. And I'll have to talk to Joaquin about that later on, but anyway. <laughs> Here's how you do it as I conclude. You surrender your, you, you set your affections on something until your affections are so wrapped up in it that thing or that person has, uh, has a, an ascendancy over your will. Those are high places in your life. Whatever you have in your life that has a hold of your will and can take God's place in your life. And, or in other words, if something has hold of you so that, it has the last say on what you do and not God. It has the greater influence over your decisions than God does. Then that's a high place in your life. And in that very place, the devil will get a hold, a foothold in your life and through that place in your life, he'll mess you up. So I want to call on you as I conclude, finish up your race with the Lord with a better resume or a better evaluation than most of these kings got. I can read, I have a whole list here, but I've run out of time. A whole list of times where God said, this king, he did good, but he left the high places. I don't want to live my life where at the end of it, God says, yeah, Fairly well done. But you left some high places. Amen? I want to get all the high places out of my life. And there's a whole section here. You can read uh, 2 Kings chapter 23 to have a great example in Josiah who pulled down the high places. He did it with passion. He did it with focus. He did it with intent. And he did it to glorify God. I mean, he went after those high places with a passion and he pulled them down and he destroyed them out of his life and out of Israel. Let's stand together, please. Or out of Judah in that case. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for this time we've had in your word. I pray you'll bless it to our lives. Help us each one, Lord Jesus, to be dedicated to bringing down and destroying the high places that we've set up in our lives. And help us to become aware of them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.